Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. It is Monday. It is the Three Martini Lunch. Somehow we're in June, uh, but we're glad you're here. Your stool is ready. We're brought to you today by Tommy John. TommyJohn.com slash martini. Much more on them in just a moment. Uh, Jim, obviously a very difficult weekend in many, many different cities uh, around the country. We are going to get to that in in great detail in our third martini, but for uh, the mental health of uh, all the patrons here at the Three Martini Lunch, we decided it's important to have some good news here because it does exist. We're not going to ignore all the bad news. We're going to get to it, but uh, it is important to uh, balance it out a little bit. And in the midst of uh, all the horrific violence and, and, and so much more that we saw on Friday and Saturday and then again on Sunday, Saturday afternoon, we had a wonderful American moment. It was supposed to happen on Wednesday, and so now it got buried with all the difficult news. But this happened Saturday afternoon, and we should not let it go undiscussed. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. Bottom dog. So there you go, Jim. That is the launch of the Dragon Endeavor crew. Two guys, Bob and Doug. Many say it sounds like a morning DJ crew or uh, uh, from those uh, Canadian guys that, that call it. Kenzie like, Brothers. Uh, yes. Kenzie Brothers, the hosers, you know. So, uh, but a, a, a picture perfect launch, uh, a great partnership, it would seem, between NASA and Elon Musk in the private sector. Uh, they docked flawlessly on Sunday with the International Space Station. So here's hoping and certainly praying for uh, a safe rest of the journey and a successful trip home. I know they've done it before, Jim, but to watch the boosters come back and land exactly in a specific spot compared to what used to happen when we watched the shuttle launch as kids is uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, Just to watch a manned mission leave from the United States was fantastic again. And so we're entering this new era of space and it's very exciting. Yeah, I was gonna say, Greg, I was struck as I was watching it Saturday morning, the, the sense, or I guess really, you know, by around Saturday midday, I guess it was more, the sense of how good it felt and how much I had found myself missing the space shuttle and missing that uh, sense of excitement, the anticipation, the countdown, uh, I suspect if you were alive when the Challenger blew up, you're kind of holding your breath shortly after lift off, lift off because you will probably never get that image out of your head of, of the explosion. And, you know, the last one was in 2011. Uh, by that point, we had kind of gotten used to the space shuttle. It wasn't seen as a, a big deal anymore. And that old saying, you know, you don't miss anything until it's gone. I think we, we suddenly, you know, all of a sudden we realized, hey, this sense of being Americans and going out to the frontier, the final frontier, Star Trek reminds us. We missed that. And that, that really was a necessary jolt of confidence and reassurance and, and a, you know, redeclaration that this country can do extraordinary things when it wants to. Uh, and we also should not ignore the fact that this is the first private company manned launch to send someone to the uh, International Space Station. Uh, we shouldn't overstate this. It's not like you're going to see Amazon and Microsoft and all sorts of competing rockets going up there. This is still, uh, you know, it's, basically it's one giant government contractor uh, in the form of SpaceX. But, uh, you know, I don't know, whether, whatever you think of Elon Musk, um, and he's had certainly an up and down year. He certainly is a uh, brilliant, but I think you can say erratic or eccentric character. He makes his share of enemies. I think you can fairly wonder whether you want the guy who's the brilliant inventor also being the CEO of your company. Those might be different jobs with different skill sets. But boy, does he get to enjoy a last laugh at this moment. And to be the guy who got back America back into space, uh, launching the car into space about a year or two ago, that was cool. But uh, you know, to actually have people up there. Um, and also, by the way, it's a, it's a little thing, but Greg, didn't the capsule and everything inside look like something out of a sci-fi movie? Yes. Even the suits look a lot different and, and almost... Uh... 21st century-ish. Well, I guess we are in the 21st century, but, uh, you know, something you would expect on Star Trek or somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's mar- you, you marvel at if you go to the Air and Space Museum or you look at the old Apollo landers or stuff, the, the, the you know, there's like a bazillion and one different switches and, and controls there and you're sitting there thinking, oh my God, how long does it take? Whereas this one, it's like three computer screens. It's a workstation. We got three screens. Just got to keep track of the three screens. You'll be fine. Um, they're really remarkable. And I think, as you said, Greg, I can't even get a boomerang to come back to me. Uh, and these guys can get a <laughs> rocket to go up and you know, take people up, launch the capsule, come back to space. I think it was like less than 10 minutes. 
<laughs> right onto the, uh, the little drone platform. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, wonderful to see. And it came along at a time when the country really needed a moment like that. No, absolutely right. And, you know, your kids aren't that old. My kids are younger. But I mean, after all of the panic and concern over the, the pandemic, and then now you've got, you know, riots going on in the streets of a couple dozen cities. Wasn't it nice to be able to tell your kids, hey, come here and watch the news with me? Uh, yes. Because uh, <laughs> finally, there's something that you can be excited to share with them in the news. Yeah, don't turn, no, turn that off. You don't want to see that. That's bad. You know? So yeah, Jim, that was a very proud dad moment and another dad moment, which can be proud or cringeworthy, depending on the gift your kids end up getting you for Father's Day uh, is just around the corner here because we are now actually in June. I'm still trying to mentally adjust to the fact that we've gone almost three months now uh, since we uh, changed our lives around. But Father's Day can be stressful trying to find the perfect gift for dad. But thankfully, Tommy John, the revolutionary underwear and clothing brand knows that comfort is for everyone and that includes even your dad. So gift him the softest, most breathable base layer he's ever worn. Their new and improved men's underwear is now twice as durable as his current pair and infinitely more luxurious, guaranteed. You ever thought of underwear as luxurious? Well, now you can. Plus, Tommy John is offering their best Father's Day deal ever with 25% off site-wide, including easy-to-gift sets that you can order straight from your phone directly to dad's door. And, you know, it's a little odd ordering underwear for your dad, and I'm not sure how I'd react to getting it. But the good thing is, is that, uh, first of all, it's top quality stuff. So your dad likes to be comfortable. Uh, he's going to appreciate it. And secondly, they've got a wide line of other things. So if that does uh, make you a little uncomfortable, you know, they got t-shirts, they got other things, they got lots of different stuff, high quality, and can absolutely uh, make your dad very pleased, uh, or your husband, or, or whoever you're shopping for with this Father's Day season. But you know, if you are the kind of person who's comfortable giving some underwear to dad, treat your dad to a few pairs of Tommy John underwear in the softest, most breathable fabrics that he has ever worn. All of Tommy John's layers are built for next level comfort. Whether you're on the hunt for lounge pants, lazy day joggers, or the softest Zoom ready tees and polos you or your dad has ever seen, Tommy John has you covered. Remember to get your order in before June 17th to ensure that your gift arrives before Father's Day. Tommy John is so confident in their underwear that if you don't love your first pair, you can get a full refund with their, quote, best pair you'll ever wear or its free guarantee, unquote. Tommy John, no adjustment needed. And I know there's some listeners out there saying, wait a minute, we're almost three months into this pandemic and just now you're telling us about lounge pants? Well, better late than never. So uh, the lounge pants, the lazy day joggers, t-shirts, polos, uh, the underwear, it's all there. Tommy John has the perfect gift for all the dads in your life. Deliver comfort to dad's door with 25% off site-wide at tommyjohn.com slash martini. That's tommyjohn.com slash martini for 25% off site-wide. See the site for full details. All right, Jim, uh, speaking of the pandemic and how all of us have been in lounge pants, Let's talk about some good news with the pandemic. This is from Reuters. Uh, the new coronavirus, novel coronavirus, as many call it, is losing its potency and has become much less lethal, according to a senior Italian doctor speaking on Sunday. This guy's name is Alberto Zangrio. He's head of the San Rafael Hospital in Milan, which is in Lombardy, which was the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in Italy. He says, in reality, the virus clinically no longer exists in Italy. The swabs that were performed over the last 10 days showed a viral load in quantitative terms that was absolutely infinitesimal compared to the ones carried out a month or two months ago, he told RAI Television. Italy has the third highest death toll in the world from COVID-19. So, Jim, this is excellent news. Uh, could be a lot of different factors here. It's run its course. Uh, the weather's getting warmer. Uh, and hopefully this means we get a summer. Yeah, you know, it could be a summer. And if this really is the case, who knows, maybe even a fall. We don't want to get excessively wildly optimistic. You don't may not want to book that cruise quite yet, but uh, it is a really encouraging sign. You know, early on in this pandemic, there was a, I think it was a doctor who wrote in the New York Times, something like, if you could get everybody in America, everybody in the world, basically, to stand six feet apart and not move for a two week period, the virus would die off. Now, by the way, when they said that, dear health officials, that was not a recommendation. It was not saying, hey, this is what you should require of citizens. It was just an observation that if you basically, if the virus survives by jumping from person to person, in, in every person that it's inside, it either uh, is, you know, eventually all defeated by the white blood cells, by your body's immune system, 
um, or it dies off, or, or it, it dies off that way, or the patient dies. And obviously, we don't want that to happen. But that's another way in which you know, once someone dies, if the body is properly disposed of, the, the virus will not jump to other people. So if you think about this vi you know, virus, is a little bit like a shark. It's always got to keep moving um, in, or else it dies, right? So Italy had very strict lockdown conditions for a very long period of time. They obviously got hit extremely hard. But this is the upside. I don't know whether people characterize this as herd immunity or whether it's other factors, but all of a sudden there's just a lot less of this virus going around and that which is, is not uh, particularly strong. This is a really good sign. Now, the interesting thing is Italy is not saying, okay, everybody back to normal. Uh, they're still being very cautious about this. They kind of, you know, don't want, last thing they want is some other flare up. Um, but these sort of test results are extremely encouraging and suggest that we could get to uh, something resembling normalcy um, in which people could confidently walk around and interact with each other, uh, concluding their low risk for the virus, instead of simply ignoring the threat and gathering in large crowds and shouting, Greg. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So do you think this, I mean, it, it, it's Italy, it's not the same situation as here, but, uh, you know, we have talked about how basically most things are shut down for the summer, lots of pools, lots of camps, uh, you mentioned cruises, uh, People might still be skittish to travel on planes, although I think that's probably picking up a little bit here. Is it possible that summer is going to look slightly normal or is it too late to put that uh, toothpaste back in the tube here? You know, it's interesting. People say that the data is about two weeks behind whatever happens. Um, you know, as they gradually, as society started reopening, they said that they weren't going to see, you weren't going to see, you know, the number of re reported positive cases spike the next day. It takes a while for people to the virus to get into people, incubate, they start to feel sick, call up the doctor and tell them, the doctor gives them a test. And that's how we get, you know, increased test numbers. I have a suspicion that government actions run more than two weeks behind the schedule, Greg, uh, that they are actually, you know, so here's the thing, based on this and the fact that, you know, quite a few states like Florida and Texas and Georgia had opened up probably about a month ago. And there really wasn't any indication of a significant uh, increase. I should I'm going to be very careful here in hospitalizations ICU usage or, um, or deaths. Now, there have been increase in cases, but let's also keep in mind, oftentimes that reflects a dramatic increase in testing, which is a good thing. But, uh, you know, the general sense is that, okay, like a lot of other viruses, maybe this isn't as bad in summer. Maybe sunlight is good. Maybe getting outside is good. Um, you know, anecdotally, and, and that study over in China suggested that there was almost no chance of catching it outside. If that's the case, you'd want as many Americans outside as humanly possible instead of locking them up in their houses for, for long stretches. So maybe we're, you know, we will luck out. My fear, Greg, is that the government will wake up to this fact a month later than they could or should have, and it'll be you know, late summer by the time they say, oh yeah, there wasn't much of a risk anyway. Although I suppose if we don't have a huge outbreak of cases two to three weeks from now, in say a whole bunch of major US cities that had large people gathering in crowds, then maybe we could take that as a useful lesson that, hey, it's, it's very safe to be outside at moments like this. From the virus, well, you set it up perfectly, Jim. Uh, we want a lot of people outside. Uh, we don't necessarily want certain types uh, congregating, that being Antifa and other people who are invading legitimate protests and trying to set things on fire, destroy private property, which we've seen in, uh, by my count, about two dozen cities now from coast to coast and from north to south. And uh, Jim, there's so many different dimensions here. We didn't want to depress everyone with three full martinis on this like we did on Friday, but there's a lot to dig into here. You devote the entire morning jolt to the lack of leadership uh, on so many different levels here. Uh, a lot of folks crying out for why hasn't President Trump done a national address uh, either Saturday or Sunday. Uh, his staff is saying, well, he addressed it while he was at NASA on Saturday afternoon. Well, uh, and what he read there that was uh, a prepared statement was uh, much better than I think some of his Twitter statements, but a lot's happened since then. And so the fact that he's really not said much since then, and certainly not on camera, is odd, I think. And uh, he's back to Twitter today and talking about poll numbers, which seems very disconnected. Uh, Joe Biden issued one statement in the middle of the night, which uh, I thought was pretty mealy mouth. Haven't heard anything from Pelosi or uh, I think McCarthy's maybe done one interview or two. I uh, haven't heard anything from Schumer. Uh, not sure Mitch has said a whole lot, although he has addressed, I think, directly what's gone on in his hometown of Louisville. Uh, governors uh, calling out the National Guard in some places, but not actually deploying them with any ferocity. Uh, mayors pretty much doing the same. We've got 
uh, folks in Minnesota and now the national media picking up on it, claiming that white supremacists are the ones doing all the damage. The media is running with that. You got Don Lemon com- comparing it to the Boston Tea Party with all this vandalism. Uh, Jim, there's a lot of people trying to cram this, uh, this unbelievable news into their pre-existing political narratives. And it's maddening, it's not helpful, and it does need to get under control. The question is how and how soon? The worst part of this is the violence. There's no two ways about that. The uh, destroying people's uh, stores, their homes, fires, the, vi- you know, the fact that people are getting hurt. Uh, I believe there's at least one pol- African-American police officer who's already been killed. There's apparently a report of some p- protester being killed. You know, you throw rocks, you throw heavy objects, you throw bricks, they're going to land on people. People are going to get hurt. And th- that is the worst part. But I think what, what is almost insult to injury is the degree to which we saw uh, elected officials, particularly in the early stage, particularly Saturday, so a little bit less of this as the weekend wore on, where their reaction was, well, this is outside interlopers. The mayor of Minneapolis who had declared uh, that there was all, this was entirely the work of people outside Minneapolis, entirely the pe- work of people outside Minnesota. And I believe the mayor of St. Paul and the governor of, Mass- of uh, Minnesota also made kind of similar comments. And then the arrest reports came in, and that wasn't really the case. I think it was like 37 out of 47, and you look at other comparisons. I'm sure there are people who are out of state in the mix. I am sure there are people who are out of town, but a significant chunk, probably a majority, are people who live right there. And I can understand the reluctance to believe that your own citizens could do something this terrible, but they did. And you have to confront that fact, and you have to address that fact. You cannot hide behind the preference that, you know, that you're used to hating white nationalists and white supremacists. You're used to hating drug cartels. You're used to hating these other groups. So you're going to, uh, Russia, you know, in the, in the words of Susan Rice, um, this idea that you, well, I hate those groups. So I'm going to blame those groups regardless of what's actually happening. What we've seen, I and mean, you can, you know, there's tons of video coming in all throughout social media. I think we all watched it all throughout weekend and well into Sunday night. It's continuing today as, as Monday progresses. Are some of these people, um, first of all, uh, there are people who genuinely want to protest the uh, actions of the Minneapolis police and a culture of brutality, a culture of callousness in America's police forces that they believe is racially driven. I think I can point to several examples of not justified police shootings or other police actions that are against white people indicating that this is probably racially exacerbated, but it's not exclusively a white cops beating up black, uh, black people problem. They no doubt came out there with a desire to simply have their voices heard. Fine. This is an American tradition. Protest has always been a you know, bedrock American value. Having said that, there are also some people out there who just want to break things. There are also some people out there who just want to commit violence. And they see this as an excuse Right? There is nothing to, to honor George Floyd when you're running into the Nike uh, store on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. There is nothing, you know, you're running into a Staples to take things, a Target to take things. That has nothing to do with George Floyd. You're doing that out of greed. You're doing that out of selfishness and you're doing it out of the sense that you do not care about anybody else. This is your moment to feel powerful over others and to take things. There's nothing noble about that. There's nothing, there's no uh, uh, sophistication. There's no nothing morally righteous about that. That is, you know, the president gets a lot of grief for, you know, for, uh, for being, you know, for calling people thugs. Well, if you're hitting people, you are a thug. It doesn't care what matter what the color of your skin is. But anyway, so all weekend we saw lawmakers who were kind of afraid to say what was actually happening, that young people in their communities were doing this, not out of a misplaced sense of outrage at the police, but because they wanted to do it. And that's, you know, it, it, you cannot solve a problem if you cannot see it. You cannot address a problem if you refuse to acknowledge that it exists. Now, as the weekend progressed, you got a little bit more honesty about this, you got a little more directness. Uh, interesting, was, you know, the president made a reference to Antifa, the anti, allegedly anti-fascist protesters who tend to behave in a very fascist manner, um, using violence against those who disagree. And you're going to see, Greg, a lot of arguments in the coming days about who is t- really Antifa and who's not really Antifa. Because, you know, in the eyes of a lot of folks on the right, if you're dressed all in black, you got the anarchist insignia on you, you're throwing a brick, you're Antifa. <laughs> to a lot of folks on the left, well, wait a second, does he have a membership card? Is he on the official duty roster for that day of Antifa? <laughs> right. If not, he's not really Antifa. He's just some thug. And there are no broader implications to be taken. Look, if every single Democrat in this country denounced Antifa tomorrow, you wouldn't shut it down. It might help a little. Might, uh, might you know, restrict them. Might give them a sense that nobody sees them as, you know, noble heroes. Nobody sees them as 
morally justified against an unjust system or something like that. Um, look, I, you know, and us for the argument that, you know, white nationalists are involved. Look, you have a huge crowd of people who are trying to make, make trouble. I wouldn't be surprised if there was, you know, some, some, uh, handful in the mix, you got a big crowd of people, um, maybe, but again, this is, you know, when you see large crowds of people breaking into the Nike store or, uh, or one of those stores, I don't see a lot of white nationalists in that crowd. I, I don't think they're being manipulated by the bunch of the losers who were in Charlottesville. And we cannot address this until we speak honestly about it, which, by the way, is one of the things that everybody who's angry about police brutality says, right? This code of silence, if a code of silence is bad for the police, a code of silence is bad for the protesters as well. Um, And the fact that this has been so widespread, I think, is an indication that there are just a lot of people who want to destroy things. They cannot create anything with their lives. They cannot make anything of themselves. So a bit like crab, you ever see the old metaphor of a bucket of crabs? You know, you go down to the, the fishing pier, somebody gets a big bucket of crabs, and the crabs can pile together and they can almost get to the top. But if one almost gets to the edge, the other crabs want to pull him back down. There is a desire in humanity that if I cannot achieve something, then I resent anyone else who achieves something else. And that is at the heart of the people who are smashing and stealing and rooting. It's into, you know, you hear, occasionally hear arguments about whether graffiti is art. I mean, the example they use, graffiti murals, are generally actually very impressive. They're big, they're colorful. You can tell what they're supposed to be, right? I mean, they were, graffiti art murals are actual art. But that's not what we're seeing all over our cities right now this weekend. These people aren't taking their time to craft something into a vivid image that catches the eye and says something. They're writing the F word, the F word police. That, that's all that is. They're, they're tagging things with profanity. That's not art. That is not an act of creation. That's an act of destruction. That's an act of desecration. And that's, you know, I, I, you're kind of left to be funneled by the fact that so many people who ran for office, who said, put me in charge, give me the responsibility, I can lead us, are watching their own cities burn, and they are afraid to take responsibility to say, I will take care of this. I will shut this down. I will tell the police to move in. We will not back down. We will not retreat from our police station as they did in Minneapolis. We will not abandon ground to the mob. We will stand up and say, no, this is a crime. No matter how angry you are about society, you are not allowed to burn down pharmacies that people depend upon for life-depending medication. You are not allowed to burn down grocery stores that people depend upon for food. And oh, by the way, there is still a pandemic going on. (laughs) I guess we just decided we're not going to ignore that completely. City after city, state after state, we see governors and mayors who are afraid to take responsibility for protecting the public. And um, yes, the violence is the worst of this, Greg, but I feel like the abandonment of duty, the abandonment of responsibility is going to be the true legacy of this painful, painful week in America. Exactly. I mean, you look at the mayor and the governor in Minnesota. I mean, they had had already two, maybe three nights of uh, very violent riots by Saturday morning. And that was the first time uh, that Tim Walls ever actually said, you know, all this stuff you're doing, that's not really honoring George Floyd. Uh, he and so many of these other leaders seem to think, that at least they did for days, that if you criticize the demonstrators for destroying property, that somehow you're not sufficiently sensitive to the cause that led to the protests in the first place and police brutality and the unjust death of George Floyd. Uh, the fact that they think people aren't smart enough to understand that they're two things that at work here is utterly ridiculous. And to watch people tag uh, some of our most honored memorials in downtown Washington, Lincoln Memorial, uh, World War II Veterans Memorial. Um, you know, a lifetime ago, our offices at Radio America were just a couple blocks north of the White House. So watching all of those things burn and get destroyed, uh, that neighborhood's very, very familiar to me. Thankfully, we're nowhere near there anymore. But that was absolutely unbelievable. And and honestly, uh, the only person I think who got it right on their first statement was the mayor of Atlanta, because I don't remember a lot more violence on Saturday and Sunday in Atlanta. There might have been some. Friday night was horrible. Uh, CNN got attacked and the College Football Hall of Fame and many other places. Uh, She went out there and basically gave the verbal smackdown of the weekend. And it looks like people paid attention. Other political leaders just didn't know what to do. And like you said, they were leaders, quote unquote, who weren't ready to lead? You know, I was watching Friday night, the live coverage on CNN. Um, and it was, it was kind of fascinating to watch the network as their own building in Atlanta was on, you know, effectively under attack. There was a long line of cops, by the way, almost entirely African-American, 
uh, of Atlanta cops in the lobby trying to prevent people from going through. They'd already broken a bunch of windows. Uh, and I think it was live on television. Uh, you know, you saw a firecracker get thrown in there and the correspondent drop an S-bomb as it kind of went off and, and the, the, the flash and the light and, and the, the boom and all that. Um, you know, it was, you know it, it was fascinating to watch. You go onto Twitter and I was struck by the number of people who looked at this event through the lens of what they thought of CNN. Now, Greg, you and I give all kinds of grief to CNN, and deservedly so for their coverage. But in a moment like this, that doesn't really matter, right? Don Lemon could be the worst anchor in the world. And I'll pause for all of our anchors, for, all of, for so many of our listeners to say, he is, but that doesn't matter. That's, you know, that CNN has a right to protect its property just like everybody else. The idea that, you know, this just, you know, violence is justified or, well, we're not going to be as angry at uh, uh, destruction of property, vandalism, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, boy, that, those fireworks that have burned somebody. You know, the, 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 all of that, we're going to we're going to kind of hand wave that away because we don't like CNN. It demonstrates that some people have just this enormous, not just partisan blinders on. Um, I think that there's actually a heart that there's there's a little more anarchism in this country. Spiritual anarchism, perhaps, is the right ter- way of putting it. Who, who just again, yeah, that you know, the, the famous quote from The Dark Knight, you know, uh, some men just want to see the world burn. There are some people who are perfectly happy at this moment to watch the country burn. And if we don't stand up to that. Uh, we will lose everything we have. No, that's exactly right. The purpose of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. And probably in that order, but property is high on the list. It's number three. And so when you've got people, like I think it was the Raleigh police chief saying, oh, it's just just property. We're not going to spend any manpower on that. That's insane. Tell that to the old woman who can't get her prescriptions filled because the pharmacy burned down. Yeah, exactly. You got all these businesses being destroyed and some of them might not uh, reopen in that community. And when you don't have the tax revenue and you got to tax uh, your own citizens through the nose to get back to where you were revenue wise, don't go wondering why it happened. It's because you basically gave the middle finger to all the business owners in your community who got nailed by these people. Anyway, Jim, that's our uplifting episode of the three. Yeah, maybe we should have, <laughs> we should have ended with the happy stuff. But anyway. <laughs> Anyway, uh, well, let's hope tonight goes better than the last few nights. Uh, My hopes aren't exactly super high, but uh, one can dream. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget our great sponsors over at Tommy John. They're over at tommyjohn.com slash martini for 25% off site-wide for Father's Day. Tommy John dot com slash martini also please subscribe to the podcast leave us a kind review and don't forget to get us on those home devices all you have to say is play three martini lunch podcast and please tune in on tuesday for the next three martini lunch